Spring's here and the bees are really bringing in the honey. It's such an exciting time of year. And we're just looking in the, in the windows here and having a look at what the bees are doing and watching them actually make their honey and even deposit the nectar in the cells with their tongues. So this week we're dedicating this broadcast to new questions from beekeepers, from people who would like to become a beekeeper, thinking about getting started. There's no such thing as a silly question. Put your questions in the comments below and I'll answer them. Ultimately, I want to help you get started and enjoy the fascinating world of beekeeping. So any questions, put them in the comments below. Meanwhile, we'll harvest a little bit of honey and talk about bees. So the first thing I'm going to do is get my little tube and put it in this position here, like that. And then I'm going to put a jar underneath. And the bees are really bringing in the honey, so it's a good time to harvest it, free up some space, and also give you some honey for your family. So what I'm doing is just getting access to the top of the frame, and then I've got what looks like a a long allen key here. I'm going to put it into the frame and simply just give it a turn. And what's going to happen is cells form inside the, the comb. Channels form inside the comb and the honey dribbles right down. My father and I spent a decade inventing this and I'm so happy to be able to share it with the world and to be able to inspire a new wave of people getting bees and harvesting honey in this way. Because if we look after the bees, then we get to share in the amazing thing we call honey. Any questions, put them in the comments below. No such thing as a silly question. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn that key for the rest of the frame, like that. And the honey should start pouring out as all the cell lines in the frame turn into channels and the honey flows down into the trough at the bottom and out of the hive into your jar. And the beautiful thing is, it's ready for the table. There's no further filtering or processing. It's, it's really interesting, although we're putting technology into the hive, you almost get a more natural experience of harvesting honey while the bees are, are doing their thing and still coming in and out of the entrance, as you can see, and really haven't even noticed that we're behind the hive here, harvesting the honey. Where do you get bees to start? Okay, so Kieran's reading out, out the questions, so you can, you can put them in the comments and, and we'll get going. So where do you get bees to start? So there's quite a few different ways to get your hive started. One is you can take a split, so if you know somebody with a hive, it can be a good thing, especially in the springtime, to take a split and free up some space in their hive. Because if you don't, often the hive will actually get so full of bees, they'll divide and swarm. And, and half the bees will fly off anyway. So taking a split from a hive is a great thing to do in springtime if you know anybody with bees. Otherwise, you can order a what's called a nucleus, which is five frames of, of uh, bees that already have, have a, a working queen laying thousands of eggs a day, which already have a functioning little hive in a box. I've got videos showing you how to install them into your hive to get started. So that's probably the easiest way, ordering a nucleus, which is like a mini hive. You can also order a package, comes in the mail, unbelievably, can be up to 10,000 bees in a box, arrives on your doorstep, and then you shake it into your hive, and it comes with a queen already mated, ready to put into your hive. There are a couple of other ways. You can catch a swarm, which is a fun thing to do. We've got videos on, on how to do that. And it's a little more adventurous, but if you happen to be in an area with lots of hives, then catching a swarm could be a great thing to do and a nice way to get started. There is a, a fifth way, and that's a, a bait hive. You can actually set up your hive, and sometimes you can put a, a scent in it. Some beekeepers put scents in there to attract a swarm of bees. So there's a few ways to get started. The honey is starting to really pour out now. And I'm just going to have a taste because it's... Mm, that's a beautiful flavour. The nice thing is, you can, as you can see here, you get all of these different colours 
and flavours in the frames and you get this um, amazing uh, kind of all of these different flavours from one hive which is such an enjoyable thing to do. Alex has a question. He wants to know how many harvests can you do with the flow frames? So it depends a bit on the strength of your colony and the season. So, so if you've got a lot of flowers flowering, the nectar's dripping to the ground, the, and you've got a really strong colony, then your bees will race out and they could even fill the whole box up again in as little as a week. That's unusual, really fun when it's happening, but like any pursuits in, in any agriculture, it, the, the, what's going on in the environment will affect how much produce you get and also the strength of your colony. So it can be many months, it can, you might, might not even get a harvest that season. Some parts of Australia are, are really dry at the moment, not much flowering, Is that not much to keep your bees going to the point where they're going to fill up the, the flow frames. So that's a long winded answer to say, sometimes really quick and sometimes really slow. Renee has a question. Um, she wants to know, would it be better putting my hive in a suburban setting or in the bush where there are lots of gum trees or tea trees? That's an interesting one. We're finding that a lot of city beekeepers are actually getting quite a long honey season because you get this, uh, people plant all different flowers in their garden so you get, get a very multi-floral experience for your bees where, where there's a continuation of something always flowering and that allows your bees to have a long season and bring in all sorts of different flavours. So some city beekeepers are, are claiming that their honey is, is more interesting than out in, in the bush. So that's what we call it here in Australia, the bush. <laughs> um, so um, it's a, it doesn't matter either way city beekeeping out in the forest um, in in the in the farmland you also get some really interesting flavors where they're planting big crops of things and you can you can really get some good harvest of that off that as well um brian wants to know how do you close the flow frame after you've opened it to harvest okay so how that works is if you look up the top here there's two slots and it might be hard to see right in there, but you can see two positions. And if you've got your tool in the lower position and turn, that's opening. And if it's in the top slot there and turn to the 90, then that's for closure. So when we're finished, we'll put it in the top, turn the handle again, and all of the channels inside the comb will then be switched back to being in cell form position. The bees will then wax it all up again, repair the cells, and the whole process starts again. Look at that. It's beautiful. So Eileen asks, how much honey do I need to leave in the hive so the bees don't die in the winter? Okay, it depends a bit on your location. So around here in the subtropical region, the answer is none. We get, we get flowers through the winter time and there's enough to keep the bees going. If you're in an area that's got a, a long cold winter, then you will need to leave honey for your bees or you'll need to feed them. So in the, the northern parts, say in Canada of, of North America, you'll find beekeepers wanting to leave a couple of boxes full of honey in order to get them to survive the winter. In in the um, southern parts of Australia, generally, a, if you leave a, a full box of honey, they'll survive well over the winter. So beekeepers who have a hive which hasn't put on much honey and it's looking a bit empty will actually feed sugar syrup to their bees to make sure the bees don't starve over the winter time. Something we don't have to deal with here, but, but if you're in one of those cold places, then you will need to make sure your bees have enough honey to survive the winter. Christopher wants to know how you would protect your hive from bears. Okay, that's an interesting one. Um, we have actually had two people write in over the last um, four and a half years that we've had, had uh, our flow hives out in the wild. And 
it's uh, been extreme for us. We don't have bears here to, to see how a bear can rip apart a beehive. Now, the way people usually manage hives in areas that have bears is they put a fence around their hive or I've heard of people putting them inside an old vehicle. I've heard of people keeping them inside. So um, there's a few things you can do in order to protect your hive from bears. Michael has been watching the programs regularly. Uh, he just wants to say thanks um, yeah, for the fantastic videos. And he wanted to mention that his own flow hives, um, he's seen flow frames fill um, within three weeks. Okay, fantastic, Michael. That's a that's a uh, that's great to hear. And um, are you getting some nice flavours? And be, see if you can describe what kind of flavours and what kind of flowers are coming in in your area, because it's really interesting. It, wherever you go, the flavours are different, and that's one of the joys of beekeeping, I think. And the flow hive does allow you to isolate different flavours from different frames. You can see one here. It's really dark, honey and that will have those dark kind of malty flavours where as this is more, uh, it's sort of an in-between, it's not really light but it's not really dark either. Williams wants to know if we're going to be at Apamondia. We are going to be at Apamondia, so we're, we're sending a, a great team there this year, so do come and say hello. Um, I won't be there but my father will be there and some of our very experienced team members will be there to answer questions and, and we'll have a stand showing um, our hives. For those that don't know what Apomondia is, it's the biannual big bee meetup of the world where there's a lot of talk, a lot of, um, a lot of people speaking from stage and a, a lot of people showing uh, what they're bringing to the world in, at their beekeeping stands. Ashley wants to know if um, we would recommend people do a beekeeping course um, with their local association um, and is there enough research online to help with beginner beekeepers? Okay, so that's a, um, that's a good question. So if you do have the chance to do a beekeeping course, if there's one in your area, it's a fantastic thing to do because you'll get some hands-on experience at working your hive. People like to learn in all different ways. Some people like to just jump in, order some equipment, get into it. Other people like to, to have a longer process where they do a course first and they learn, uh, they learn how to manage their bees and decide whether it's for them and so on. So it's a little bit up to you. What we have is a whole lot of material to help you get started. So if you look at our, our YouTube channel and also our Facebook page, you'll find lots of information on how to install your bees, how to do your brood inspections and, and what to do in order to look after them. Now, lots of people are enjoying learning off that, but it's also good to find a mentor that can help you because sometimes you're looking in your hive and you don't know what's going on. And if you can't find an experienced mentor, then even doing it with another beginner is a nice thing to do where you can beekeep together and learn as you go. I'm here each week also to answer questions live. So if you've got a specific question, you can jump on here, let me know what it is, and I'll see if I can help you. Peter, who is another regular, um, wants to know about um, preventing swarming and also if we will do a split in future. Okay, great. We've got some videos showing how to do a split, and there's a few different types of splits, but basically what that means for those that are new to beekeeping is taking some of the brood frames out of the bottom box here. In the bottom box is regular conventional frames, which are basically a wooden frame with either naturally drawn comb or, or, or um, wax or plastic foundation in them. The bees have then drawn them out and they have the queen's laid eggs in the cells and there's brood on them and so on. And it's a case of taking some of those frames out, putting them into the, a new box. You can either let them raise a new queen themselves if they have eggs on the frame to do so, or you can order a new queen and get some specific genetics off a bee breeder. If you're wanting a nice gentle hive, I'd recommend ordering a, a already mated queen with nice calm genetics. You can put them 
uh, into your new box, take them home to your place, and away you go, look after them, and they'll grow, and eventually be storing beautiful honey like this in your Flow Super. The Super is the name for the box where the bees are storing honey. Kristen just wanted to let us know that she's got four flow hives and she promotes them everywhere she can. Thanks a lot. It's so great to hear so many stories of people really enjoying what we've invented here. And it really does make it all worthwhile when those stories come back to us. So please send in pictures, send in, send in videos so that, that, so that we can have a smile on our face watching, watching um, all the beautiful honey harvests from all corners of the globe. Is there an advantage to using two flow keys to open a flow frame? Okay, that's a, um, that's a good, good question and that's certainly something you can do. So what they're talking about there, let's see if I've got another flow key. If you could have a look for, for one around, Kieran. Perhaps there's another one um, just in, the, in their garden there. And I can show you just how that works. So basically, um, in the top here, generally one's all that you require. But if you're doing a lot of harvesting, you might want to speed things up a little bit and put a second key in the top. So if you're doing one opening in segments like this, will make it a bit easier. If you've got two, you can generally open the whole lot in one go. Oh, for a really tough frame, you still might want to divide it in segments, but with two, you put them in like that and actuate them like a butterfly, like this, and that just gives you half the amount of effort on the key in order to lift all of those parts. And if you're doing a, a lot of frames, let's say you've got you've got five hives and you want to get, get along and harvest a whole lot of honey, then that'll certainly make things a little bit quicker. So Mick has a really good question. So he wants to get a flow hive for this spring in Australia, but he needs to move in January of next year. So he's concerned about whether he can move a hive if he set it up. You certainly can. We've got videos showing you how to move your hive. But the basics of it is you want to move them in, in the cooler part of the day. So you can either move them in the night or in the, in the early morning and um, what you want to avoid is long, hot travelling days when you're moving bees. But the basics of it is when the bees are all home if at night or in the evening or early morning before the bees are flying for the day, you close up your hive, you basically put something in the entrance to block their way out. And then you'll need to strap your hive up, take off the roof, you repair it, you lift it onto a trailer or a yeah. Sorry, Sam, I've got a technical issue. I just need to put some batteries in your mic. Okay. Um, just one second. Okay, should be back on now, sorry about that. Batteries went flat on this little wireless microphone here. So we were just talking about moving a hive and the basics of it is you you close them up in the in the night or early morning when the bees are all home, strap your hive up, put it onto a, a back of a truck or a trailer. It's best not to have them inside the car with you in case you have an accident and then you travel um, to your new location, you put them down and you open the entrance and the bees then will reorientate to the new spot. So there's a few caveats about that and bees, bees are really clever. If you're w within, in like a, um, a it, it's basically, you wanna be going more than 
six kilometres or four miles or so. Um, that way the bees won't recognise the new area. Otherwise, a whole lot of them will come back to the old location. If you have to move them a short distance, we've also got videos showing you how to do that. But basically, a, a short move, you can either just move them a couple of metres at a time, or you can, you can move them um, all in one go and then use some, some reorientation techniques by putting barriers, a whole lot of branchy stuff or tape um, some cloth over the entrance so the bees are like, something's different, something's different. And then most of them will reorientate to that new spot and, and you'll get less bees returning to where the old hive was. So a couple of tips there on moving your beehive. You certainly can. We move hives quite regularly and migratory beekeepers will move thousands of hives as, as they go to new locations where the flowers are. Gallo has a question. So he's got a flow hive. He's in New Jersey, USA. He has two brood boxes and he put the flow super on two weeks ago, but so far he hasn't seen anything happening. He just wants to know if you've got any tips or any advice for him. Yep, great, good question. So. So basically there is a few tips. If um, the, the recipe for getting fast activity for the first time on your flow frames is lots of bees when you open the window and a good nectar flow. If those things don't coincide, it will be slow. So hopefully you've got a good nectar flow and your bees are building up. What you want to see when you open the window is lots of bees. If you've only got one or two, then you might not have enough bees really to fill that next box. Now, if you're getting impatient, you can speed things up. And the way I recommend doing that is just getting some bird comb from your brood box, so the, the comb that they build up on top of the frames, in between the frames, etc. Get your hive tool and just mash it into the surface of the flow frames. You won't break the flow frames, you just get your hive tool, put it in there. The bees will then go, hang on a minute, that's in the wrong spot and they'll redistribute and recycle that wax to that area where you've put it. So it'd be fun to do it in the observation window. You can actually watch them chew that wax up and distribute it over that area of the flow frames and get some faster activity if you're getting impatient. Aaron wants to know if it would be necessary to put insulation in the roof of the flow hive. So some beekeepers in cold climates do insulate their hive for winter and others don't. It's a much debated topic, but if you're going to insulate, you can do a, a wrap of insulation around your hive and also some insulation material under the roof of your hive. Other beekeepers claim that you can dig a hive like this out of the snow and there's no problem. Bees are good at looking after themselves, but you do want to protect your colony from wind. So you would want to have the ventilation closed on your your screen bottom board. The flow hive has these vents here. Vents down is less ventilation and that means you won't have the wind pouring up through the screen bottom board and up into your hive. The vents up allows the air to flow through and up through the screen. So there's a couple of settings there that you want to be mindful of when it comes to a cold winter. I live in the suburbs. This is a question from Chris. I live in the suburbs and I have limited space in my backyard. I've also got kids that play in the yard. The hive would be put in the corner facing north towards parklands. Do you think the kids would be bothered by the bees or would the bees be bothered by the kids? Okay. The answer is it depends, <laughs> like many of the answers in beekeeping. So what you want, if you're, if you're wanting to, to be behind the hive here like this and harvest honey with your kids and so on, then you want some nice calm genetics. Now to get that, you're best off ordering a nucleus or, or a queen, depending on which way you're starting your hive, off a bee breeder and ask for some nice gentle genetics. The difference between a hive that's very aggressive and protective um, to one that's nice and gentle is, is quite big and it's a joy to have a nice gentle hive in your yard and it can be a nuisance to have an aggressive one in your yard. So genetics is the first thing. Um, the next thing that's a, a good idea is make sure there's no one with anaphylaxis. There's, 
people that they can get anaphylaxis from sti insect stings or peanuts or, or, or all sorts of things and you don't want to um, be increasing any risk there. So, so that's one thing to, to think about. Um, and we've got first aid information on our website about all of that. So have a read of that also. The next one is situating your hive. So if you situate it in a position where the bees can fly up and away without bothering anybody, then that's a good idea. Basically, you want to um, not point it at, at the pathway where people might be walking. You don't want to point the entrance right um, over your neighbours either. So. So um, it's about um, just finding that location where the bees can get up and away wi without bothering anyone. Because what happens if you've pointed it where people normally walk is you get some accidental bees flying into people's hair. The person gets a little flustered and might get a sting on, on their head. So, so point it away from people. Um, we've got videos showing you uh, more in depth about situating your hive that you can take a look at. Reese wants to know when you get your super, so when the flow frames arrive, are they already set to the closed position or are they set to the open position? That's a good question. The answer is they're set to the closed position, however in transit they can move a bit. So we always recommend getting your key and as you install your flow frames, follow our installing your flow frames video which will show you that when you put the frames in the box for the first time, the key goes in the top slot, give it a turn, make sure all of the cells in your frames are in that closed position for the bees to wax up and to start building their cells out and putting the nectar in. Ellie wants to know, she lives in Singapore, and she wants to know, would the flow hive work in an urbanized country that's tropical? Absolutely. So. So in, in the tropics you get a really long season. Now it's, um, and which is a great thing basically. It, here we, don't, we never have to take the, the flow frames off the hive. Some beekeepers in colder climates will take the, take the um, honey supers or the flow super off for the winter. In the subtropical or tropical regions you can leave it on year round, which just means a bit less um, work. So basically it can stay in this form uh, all year. Um, the, you also get nice nectar flows throughout the winter time. I was just in, in Fiji and having a look at an apiary there which is a very tropical region. You do get times when there's a lot of rain which means um, that can be time, you might not get so much uh, nectar at that time because it's a bit too rainy for the bees to fly out and get it. So um, there will be times when there's less honey but basically you can leave um, the flow super on all year round and enjoy all the flavours as they come. Another factor is the bees. So in some countries it's a bit harder to get your bees and then in some countries there's actually slightly different um, types. So we've got, this is Apis mellifera, which is the main honeybee that's used all over the world. There's also Apis serrana, which you'll find in Japan, you'll find in, in some, some parts of Asia. And it also can be used for flow frames, but we've designed actually uh, shorter flow frames that go into a smaller hive for that bee because it's a, a smaller bee and likes different geometry. So you want to make sure you can get some Apis mellifera, which is the, the European honeybee, in order to harvest your, um, in order to use the flow hive in this form. Melissa's in New Jersey, USA, and it's been her first year of beekeeping. She's getting ready for winter storage, and she wants to know, after harvesting the honey, and removing the flow super for, for the winter, should I completely clean off all of the capping and wax or leave it for or leave it on the flow frames for the next year? Okay, if you can store them well so rodents and things aren't getting to the flow frames, then and it, and if it's cold, then I would just leave it on. If um if if you can't store them well, then it might be a good idea to give them 
are clean first. But you can either store them in a freezer if you happen to have a deep freeze and then they're totally fine as is. Or if, if it happens to be really quite cold where you are, then you might just be able to seal them up so no wax moth or anything get in there and start making a mess and you should be able to leave them as is as well. You won't find any issues with honey going fermentation if it's cold, fermented if it's cold and as far as I know you, you shouldn't have problems so much with wax moths and things. It's more like um, rodents that might, might find them tasty and take up residence. Ellie just wanted to thank you for the descriptive answer. She, she was the person who lived in Singapore. She's really happy with the response. Um, we have a few other people that want to know, when you start a new hive, how long would it be until you could expect to harvest, harvest some honey? Okay, good question. So, so Stone here behind the camera, he started his hive and it was an extraordinary uh, um, start where a week later he was harvesting. He harvested the frames. Another week went by, they were full again. And that happened multiple times. Now that's an extreme story of how fast it can be. That only happens if you've got a lot of flowers and a really strong colony in your brood box here. So typically it's much longer than that and you can, you can be expected to wait uh, some months or many months. Sometimes you won't even get a harvest in the first season if you don't have many flowers around. So if it's really dry in your area, it might take some time or you might have to wait till the next season to get a really good harvest but it's fun when it comes in fast if things align and you've got really healthy bees and a lot of flowers then it's really amazing to watch how fast bees can go. We have a question here do I need to open the hive to do inspections and what do I need to look for? Great question so beekeeping isn't set and forget like many many forms of agriculture like many pursuits that are things you need to do so the brood box needs inspecting needs needs to be um, open so you need to get in your bee suit get your smoker take your top box off and do what's called a brood inspection and we do that we often show you that live and show you how to do your brood inspections now once you've got that top box off you basically get your hive tool out and you take some of the brood frames out and it's actually a real honour to be able to look in at what the bees are doing and see the fascinating world and all of the amazing things they do to create their colony. And what we find is customers who, who um, weren't really sure what they might have to do end up really enjoying that process of watching the bees build their natural comb, watching the bees lay their eggs and produce their babies and they end up fascinated by this new world of beekeeping. Now basically uh, the best thing you can do is have a look at one of our videos titled, titled Brood Inspection and you get a good idea of what you need to do. The frequency you need to do that will really depend Around here, the commercial beekeepers will make sure they do a full brood inspection for pests and diseases um, a couple of times a year. And they'll get through every frame, hold them up to the light and make sure there's, there's no disease in there. Now, in other parts of the world, it's much more frequent. So if you've got Varroa mite in your continent, which most other continents except Australia have, then you'll need to have a management plan in place for those little mites that get on your bees. So there's various different treatments for them. Some people put um, uh, chemical strips into the hive. Uh, other people follow um, more natural approaches and you'll have to find out what you'd like to do by asking the beekeepers in your area and perhaps getting some help with that as you get started. Um, so yeah, the obligate, what you have to do to look after your bees does differ. You can, in this area, you can have a hive that, that can go a long time without needing to, to do a brood inspection. It's not like chickens where you have to be there to close them up every night. You can go away and come back and your bees will still be fine. 
So Laura has a hive and she wants to put it in her veggie patch, but she wants to know if the sprinkler that's set to water the garden every day, um, would it be best to set the timer before dawn? Not a bad idea, setting the timer before dawn. I th I, your bees won't really mind too much about the sprinkler. They're, they're amazing, they, they even do fly in a bit of rain. My son gets out there with the hose and I keep telling him not to water the beehive, but he does anyway. <laughs> and if you've got a friendly colony, they won't be bothered by it and it'll all be okay. However, it, if you can set it before dawn, it's probably a good idea. When you put a flow hive together, what anti-mold paint do you use that won't hurt the bees? Okay, so there's varying different things you can do. This hive's now been here for a couple of years and you can see that um, it could do with a little sand and recoat. The, there's various different products available at your hardware stores. Generally the ones that are built for outdoor decking are the strongest and best and will last the longest if you're trying to keep the wood look. If you're trying to keep the wood look outdoors, you're always fighting a little bit. Naturally, wood wants to turn, turn grey and turn back into, into nature when it's outdoors. So if you do want to keep it looking this beautiful wood, then I recommend you get the Western Red Cedar version because it's naturally resistant and will last a lot longer in, in that beautiful wooden look. If, um, if you want to have, uh, and having said that, you still should retouch it up um, every six months or so if you want to keep it looking good like that. You can also paint your hive. You can see down here, this um, one here, you can have fun painting it and that will be a, a coat that will last for years if you need um, to, to get that long lasting look. So have fun painting it. That's a, just an outdoor house paint. will last for years and years like that. So you answered Melissa's question about storing her flow frames over winter. She has another question. Um, she wanted to know, was there, would there be any trouble with the operation of the flow frames leaving the capping there? Or, what, or should she wait till the bees have taken that off? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And over a, a 10 year development time, we actually got lucky. Some of my early prototypes uh, my dad and I were working on, we were trying to take the capping away in order to harvest. And to do that we had very complex systems of, of diaphragms at, at the time that were um, made out of old car inner tubes and things to, to actually provide movement to move away a front section with the capping on it in order to allow the honey to then drain out of the cells. What we eventually found is our method of making vertical channels through the comb. So, so basically it's like this and then each cell moves like that, allowing the honey to drain down into the next cell below and eventually into the trough at the bottom and out. And that can happen while the capping's still in place, which was a real win because that means less disturbance for the bees. The bees are standing on their capping and the honey just drains out beneath the feet. But the next thing was to know what would happen next. Would the bees chew off the capping in order to, for the process to start again? And luckily they do. Somehow it's different underfoot and they know that there's no honey in that cell. And they'll quickly start to chew the capping off, recycle that wax and the whole process starts again. Laura wants to know, um, how would you go about re-protecting the hive with a paint or oil? What's the process when there's bees inside the hive? Okay, so this is a little bit up to you. And it, as per normal, wear your bee suit around your hive if you need a beekeeping until you're very comfortable with your bees and how they behave. A hive like this, I will often, um, if, if I need to touch it up, I'll just leave the bees in and you can get to it with some sandpaper and some oil and the bees don't seem to mind at all. Even house paints, once your bees are established in your hive, it's very, very rare for them to leave. They've got their babies in there. So I've been so surprised you can even paint the entrance side of the box if you choose a time when there's not many bees covering it and the bees don't seem to mind at all. 
We have a question here. When I first get started, how often should I check the frames in the brood box? So, if you're choosing to do naturally drawn comb, like we have lots of videos about, then then it's a good idea to check them. Let's say you've just shaken a swarm into the box and they're building like crazy. If it's a really strong swarm, then I would actually check them every few days because it's fascinating. But the, the main reason with naturally drawn comb is you want them to build straight. If they start going wonky, they'll continue going wonky and the whole thing turns into a mess that's hard to service. So I just want, until they've started to draw their nice straight comb, then you'll want to check in on that and if they start going wonky you can get your hive tool and push them back online. As soon as they've got nice straight combs in the brood box then away you go, you can then let them settle in, build out their frames and continue to, um, to, to for the queen to lay eggs and the, the whole brood box then needs a bit less um, looking in as they expand in to the flow super. So yeah, there's a long-winded way of saying if you're starting with naturally drawn combs, check off it in the beginning to make sure they're going straight. If you're starting with foundation frames, either plastic or wax foundation, then they'll be going straight anyway. You can basically set and forget and leave them a number of weeks before looking in to see how they're going. Pradeep just wants to know, is the flow hive available in India? It is. So we we um, have warehouses in, in lots of parts of the world and we can ship um, to you. So get in touch if you'd like to do some, um, to get your flow hub going in India. We do have customers in India. So Andy has a question about swarming. So if the bees swarm and you're not at home and you can't find them, um, will the bees left over already have a baby queen hatching? or will they start to feed royal jelly to an existing larvae? What's the process of a swarm and the colony left behind? So generally the bees are pretty advanced there. They will have another queen ready to go at the time when the hive swarms. So the old queen actually gets kicked out by half the bees and uh, reluctantly she leaves. They starve her first so she's light enough to fly and, and then off they go with, with some of the bees driving the swarm of where to go and there's this amazing system where, they, where, where some of the bees are flying around through the swarm like this, high speed and telling it where to fly and then they have this incredible um, democratic system of deciding where to go and where to take up new residents. But to answer your question, the bees left behind 90% or more of the time will get it together to have their new queen and away they go. But it is a time where they've suddenly lost a lot of the numbers. So if you've got the small hive beetle in your area, which is a little black beetle, that can be a time where you need to make sure they're not taking over your hive. Because if you've got a, a big hive with lots of combs and lots of honey in it, and not enough bees to police that area and look after it, that's when those little beetles can take over. So if your hive has swarmed, keep an eye, make sure the hive beetles aren't taking over your hive. So in regards to swarming, David has followed up with an, a question. Um, what are some of the signs that bees are starting to swarm and what can be done to avoid this? Okay, so the first sign is overcrowding. So if the bees are getting to levels like this, there's a lot of bees in here, they even will get more crowded than that and as they get more crowded they'll actually start balling up at the entrance and when you see bees balled up at the entrance and hanging down off the landing board then that's a sign that they're, st they're preparing to swarm. Not to be confused with a hot day where your bees are just out the front and all kind of upwards facing from the landing board. So you can have a lot of bees on a hot day outside your hive just making room for ventilation inside. But uh, when it starts to hang down kind of a ball from the landing board, that's a, a really good sign that they're going to swarm soon. And what you can do to avoid them swarming if you don't want them to swarm, and many beekeepers employ strategies to, to limit swarming behaviour, is you can either get into your brood box and knock off the queen cells 
Now, I don't tend to do that. I'd rather take a split and go, wow, this hive's doing so well. Let's make another hive. So taking a split is my preference, where you take out some of the frames. If they've got queen cells on them already, even better. If you, um, if you want to um, buy in a queen, then you might not want ones with queen cells on them. But basically taking a split will provide new fresh brood combs in the bottom box that the bees will then uh, draw out and, and provides a whole lot of extra space for the queen to start laying in that lessens that um, trigger of overcrowding that triggers swarming. Now another one is not enough space to store honey so in the springtime if your hive is looking like this with a lot of honey in the window then harvest some, free up some space, make sure your bees have something to do and, and that'll limit the, the swarming behaviour as well. So a few things you can do there. Um, spring management, it also if, you, if you're not taking a split and you want to limit swarming, putting two fresh frames say in this position and this position in the brood nest will open it up. But to do that you'll need to take out a couple of other frames. So generally the frames on the edge have have uh, honey in them, you can take them out, eat the honey, move the frames apart and put in two fresh frames here and here that will also limit swarming behaviour. So Diana just wants to say on behalf of the bees, honey lovers worldwide and the ecosystem of the whole planet, thank you team Flow Hive. Thank you, it's certainly something that keeps us going is to us sending beehives out into the world is a bit of a, a window into a new world for people and we get this beautiful feedback where, where um, a, a beekeeper will start their journey and start really connecting the dots between what bees are doing, the garden, the flowers, the trees and suddenly realise the, the interconnectedness of, of our natural world and it's it's such an important thing, I think, to, to get kids off screens, get them out into the yard, get them to see where food comes from, get them to be able to produce their own and, and really connect our natural world to our, our food source. And what happens then is you start advocating for our bees and you get these beautiful stories coming in of people making their whole block an insecticide free zone which is an important thing to do in a world where we currently have a, a billion litres of insecticide sprayed on our earth each year. So to, to be creating zones and creating habitat for not only our European honeybees that do an incredible amount of work pollinating our crops and also producing amazing honey but also the other native species, the 20,000 native bee species of the world which need habitat, which need zones that are safe for them and in doing so we get these stepping stones across the urban landscape and we could save some of those species from the brink of extinction. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. If you've got any more questions you can put them in the comments below. It's great to hear your questions as you, you are thinking about beekeeping and I'll be here to help you each week get started. So best of luck on your beekeeping journey. We do have um, something exciting coming up so stay tuned, make sure you get on our mailing list. We have, a, an ex if you're thinking about getting started in beekeeping, put your email in and we'll let you know later today what we have. So, so um, stay tuned and best of luck with, with your beginning in beekeeping.